Nokia's are real nasty. They know the way of the Sakai. Welcome back, Autobots, Decepticons, and everything in between to another Transformers Theory. Today's is going to be a deep dive into the AllSpark mutations. Who they are, how they're created, and what happened to them are all questions that will be examined in this video, in addition to some fun facts and misconceptions about them. So, I guess a good place to start is to give a brief overview on the AllSpark mutations. The AllSpark mutations were introduced to us in Transformers 2007. These Cybertronians were created by the AllSpark, an ancient artifact that has the power to bring ordinary machines to life. After being hit by an asteroid, the cube landed on our planet. And some years after its discovery, the United States government put in place the top secret organization, Sector 7, to be a special access division of the government that specialized in taking care of extraterrestrial technology and threats. Eventually, the organization learned of the AllSpark's power to bring mundane machines to life and began a battery of experiments to test the limits of the AllSpark's capabilities. These experiments would lead to the creation of the very first AllSpark mutations, and though we never get to see them, we can clearly see the damage they left behind. In the year 2007, Samwood Wiki and company were taken to the Hoover Dam, which unbeknownst to them and the general public, was actually the secret headquarters of Sector 7. Tom Banachek, the head of the organization, would give a tour of the facility. He took everyone to see a demonstration of the cube's power. And here is where the first on-screen AllSpark mutation was created. After Glenn Whitman donated his Nokia cell phone, Seymour Simmons placed the phone into a specialized containment box, and then funneled the cube's radiation into it. This caused the cell phone to come to life. But when it started breaking the box, Banachek was forced to unleash a massive electrical surge in order to kill it. More AllSpark mutations would be created later in the film during the final battle. While being chased by the Decepticons, Samwood Wiki accidentally fell with the AllSpark when an SUV almost hit him. This fall caused the AllSpark to activate, creating an uncontrolled Energon pulse that brought the SUV's steering wheel to life. It wiggled itself free from the steering column and clamped down onto its driver's face. This Energon pulse also brought a X Xbox 360 game console to life. The robot's arms busted free from the packaging, and the shocked owner of the console threw it away before it could fully escape. Lastly, this Energon Pulse brought a Mountain Dew vending machine to life. It busted out of its cage and proceeded to shoot bystanders with unopened soda cans. More AllSpark mutations would be created in the follow-up movie, Transformers Revenge of the Fallen. While packing for college, Sam held up his infamous D-Day shirt that he wore during the Battle of LA. He discovered a fragment of the AllSpark had been stuck in the shirt. When he touched the fragment, it activated, causing him to drop it. It burnt a hole through his bedroom floor and into the Witwicky kitchen, where it sent out a pulse of Energon radiation which brought the household appliances to life. After coming to life, the appliance boss proceeded to cause havoc and mayhem, chasing down Sam and trying to shoot him. Sam escaped through his bedroom window, but the appliance boss continued their assault, even expanding it to include Ron Witwicky, and the doghouse for Mojo and Frankie. As Ron and Sam sought covered behind the backyard fountain, Sam called out to Bumblebee who was hiding in the garage. The appliance bots were no match for the Autobot, and were all swiftly taken out, including part of the Witwicky household. No more AllSpark mutations would be created after this event, since the AllSpark shard that created the appliance bots would be destroyed when Sam and the gang used it to revive the Decepticon Seeker Jetfire. The only other remaining piece of the AllSpark was also destroyed when it was stolen by the Decepticons in order to bring Megatron back to life. So with that brief recap out of the way, there are many questions people have about these little dudes. One of the most prominent ones being what exactly happened to the steering wheel, Xbox 360, and vending machine mutations. And well, the most common and accepted theory is that they were taken out by the Autobots and the military. This theory is built off of the in-universe fact that the United States government wanted to neutralize all Decepticon threats. And since these guys were causing havoc around the city and drawing a lot of attention to themselves, I'm sure it's safe to say that the military and the Autobots killed them. Furthermore, the Transformers Revenge of the Fallen movie prequel comic Alliance would confirm this theory. And though the majority of the stories in the comic universe are no longer canon to the films due to Age of Extinction and The Last Knight screwing up their timeline, parts of this comic fit nicely within the in-universe Bayformers canon. This comic in particular was set right after the event 
events of the Battle of LA, and gave closure for two mutations. The Xbox 360 mutation, now named Ybox for copyright reasons, was spotted by Captain Lennox and his team. It tried to escape into a red van after the soldiers opened fire. However, its fate would be sealed when Ironhide blew up the van, and fished out its remains to make sure it was dead. The vending machine mutation, on the other hand, would attack Sandwich Wiki with a Mountain Dew can. However, he was swiftly crushed to death by Ratchet. After examining the substance that the mutation left behind, the Autobot medic went on a tangent stating how Mountain Dew would erode your teeth and make you fat. Now, another question I get asked constantly is what exactly a AllSpark mutation is. Some folks think that all Transformers created by the AllSpark are AllSpark mutations. However, this isn't the case. AllSpark mutations are strictly Cybertronians that were created when the AllSpark infused its energy into a piece of human technology. Think about it like this. The reason why AllSpark Mutation has mutation in the name is because the cube's energy mutated a piece of human technology into a Transformer. Interestingly enough, the term AllSpark Mutation is never said in any of the films. The term originated from issue 1 of Transformers Alliance. Now, another common question I am asked is if the AllSpark Mutations are mindless drones or intelligent beings. A lot of people believe that they are drones due to the fact that they acted like foral homicidal maniacs in the first film. Screenwriter Roberto Orki would go on record agreeing with this point three days after the film was released, when responding to a fan on the now-defunct Transformers official movie form, stating that the mutations were soulless primal Transformers. However, this statement doesn't really hold up anymore since when Transformers Revenge of the Fallen was released. The AllSpark mutations in that film showed a significant level of intelligence, since they were able to signal to each other in order to coordinate an attack, in addition to climbing up on one another in order to open Sam's door. Revenge of the Fallen proves to us that the AllSpark mutations are intelligent beings, and not mindless drones. Furthermore, these mutations had a lot more screen time than the ones in the 07 film, so we really didn't get to see how intelligent they were due to their lack of screen time. But if Revenge of the Fallen is anything to go by, we know for a fact that the AllSpark mutations are intelligent beings. So with that squared off, another question that I want to address is why the AllSpark mutations are all evil. And well, that's because they are all born Decepticons. This is evident since each of the appliance bots have a Decepticon insignia on them. However, as for the 07 mutations, none of them have any visible Decepticon insignias. So you could say that this disqualifies them from being Decepticons. However, since they all have Decepticon-like features in addition to having a natural-born instinct to kill, I think it's safe to say that they were Decepticons. So then why does the cube only make Decepticons and not Autobots? Well, the film tells us that all forms of human technology were reverse-engineered from Megatron. Fact is, you're looking at the source of the modern age. Microchip, lasers, space flight, cars, all reverse engineered by studying him. Furthermore, when a fan asked why the cube only made Decepticons, screenwriter Roberto Orki stated that the AllSpark is meant to power Cybertron, not adapt human technology. Also, since all Earth's tech is reverse engineered from Megatron, maybe that affects the outcome too. This seems to be the most commonly accepted answer among fans. However, I think there is more to this than meets the eye. Since the AllSpark chose to fix Frenzy's body when he got close to it, while when Bumblebee held the cube in his hands, it did nothing to fix his voice box. Now, I don't have an exact answer to why the AllSpark favors the cons over the boss just yet, but I plan to cover this phenomenon in a future video, so stay tuned. Now, from here, I want to switch gears and cover each AllSpark mutation individually, in addition to talking about some fun facts about them. Starting off with good old Nokia bot, did you know that originally he wasn't even going to be a Nokia? The director of the film, Michael Bay, really wanted to use an iPod for this scene. However, Steve Jobs wouldn't let him, and so Bay ended up using a Nokia N93i. Originally, when we did this scene, I really wanted to have a little iPod, but Steve Jobs wouldn't allow it, so we ended up using some... I guess Nokia phone and whatnot. This whole scene, for the most part, would have acted out exactly the same way as it did in the film. However, at one point before Banachek would kill the mutation, iPod Bot would have played the song Master of No Mercy by Suicidal Tendencies. Here's an early concept art of what the iPod Bot could have looked like. And I really like how the iPod screen would have ended up on his chest. Another interesting fact about Nokia Bot is that the burned out husk of the dead Nokia is actually a physical prop. 
It was made from a bunch of spare Frenzy fingers from the Frenzy animatronic, in addition to a few fake Nokia bits. Another cool fact is that Nokia Bot's minigun is modeled after a GE M134 minigun, and his missile launcher is modeled after a RPG-7 40mm. Lastly, the Nokia Bot made an appearance in a Verizon Fios TV commercial, where Michael Bay smacked a Nokia Bot and he exploded midair. Moving on to the steering wheel bot, there is unfortunately no information on him at the moment, besides the fact that he transforms into a 2007 Cadillac Escalade steering wheel. However, a mini theory of mine on this guy is that the entire Escalade became a Transformer, and not just the steering wheel. As I stated in my Protoform Misconceptions video, some Transformers are born with Minicon partners, proven by the fact that Scorponok is integrated inside of Blackout. I think the same case happened with the steering wheel bot. You see, it wouldn't make sense for just the steering wheel to become a Transformer, since we clearly see the Allspark's energy go under the vehicle, and though the energy did not flow over the car like it did to the vending machine and Xbox 360, the wheel still came to life. So by that logic, it would make sense for the Cadillac to come to life as well. Now let's move on to the Xbox 360 bot. When he comes to life, he makes the Xbox 360's signature turning on sound. Another interesting fact is that due to copyright reasons, the Xbox mutation is depicted as a fictional Y-Box console in both his appearances in the Look and Find Transformers book and in the first issue of the Transformers Alliance comic. Lastly, compared to Steering Wheel Bot and Vending Machine Bot, Xbox Bot has the least amount of screen time. However, this originally wasn't going to be the case. In a deleted scene, the Xbox 360 robot would have broken out of his box and would have beaten the crap out of his owner, in addition to tearing off a woman's dress. Unfortunately, animation of the Xbox 360 robot was never made for the scene, so the only visual cue that we have of him is his arms popping out of the box. So with that said, let's move on to the last Allspark mutation for the 2007 film, that being the Mountain Dew vending machine bot. And unlike the others, he does have an official name, that being Dispensor. While going unnamed in the film, Dispensor's name was first suggested to Greg Lombardo, Hasbro's head of marketing for Transformers, by Daniel Susby Shud during a tour of Hasbro's offices at BotCon 2007. The name was eventually made official later on when figures were created for the vending machine Transformer. Dispenser up to this point in time only has two figures, the first of which was part of a Robot Heroes 2 pack of him and Ironhide that came out in 2008. The second figure came out in 2014, and was part of Takara Tomy's Transformers Movie Advance series. This figure of him was a redeco and retool of the Transformers The Game payload figure. This is why he now transforms into a armored truck decorated like a Mountain Dew delivery vehicle. However, due to copyright reasons, the markings on the truck mode say Mood Whiplash instead of Mountain Dew. The top of his truck mode features tampographs that resemble the front of a Mountain Dew soda machine. This was done so you could still transform him into a vending machine if you untab and flip down the roof of the vehicle. Another interesting fact is that according to Cinefax Magazine number 111, the inclusion of Dispensor was a last minute addition, and all the modeling and animation was done for him in only four weeks. Now the last fun fact about him is that he appeared in a game called Capture the Cube. It was an online game that was put up on PepsiCo's Mountain Dew websites on June 9th, 2007. It was developed by Tribal DDB Dallas, with animation being provided by the Canadian animation studio replaced by robots. In the game, you stake out Sector 7's headquarters as Dispensor, in the hopes of capturing the Allspark Cube. In the game, you have to bypass many security measures, such as metal detectors and security lasers. You even get to transform into a vending machine and serve Mountain Dew to unsuspecting humans. You win the game when you reach the room where the Allspark is being held. This game was pretty unique among the other online offerings at this time since it had a total of five video cutscenes. So with Dispensor squared off, that covers all of the Transformers 2007 mutations. But now let's jump right into Revenge of the Fallen and cover the appliance bots. Now the term appliance bots comes from the film's novelization written by Alan Dean Foster. Yet the various creative types interviewed on the Revenge of the Fallen special features DVD refer to them as the kitchen bots, while a Revenge of the Fallen coloring book refers to them as the kitchen crew. However, the name appliance bot is the one most people use when referring to these guys, hence why I am designating them as such. Now before I cover each individual appliance bot, 
I want to address a common misconception people have. That being that the fridge and the oven came to life when the Shard created the appliance bots. People believe that the fridge and the oven came to life due to them opening. However, this isn't the case. The reason why they opened was due to the force of the Allspark Shard's energy. This can be proven since you can see that the cabinets and drawers were also opened as a result of the shockwave. However, the smoking gun here is that we don't see the Energon radiation cover the fridge and the oven, like it did for the other appliance bots. So with that said, the oven and the fridge did not come to life. And with that misconception squared off, we can talk about the first appliance bot on the list, which would be BlenderBot, who transforms into a Cuisinart Smart Power Duet Blender, model number BFP-703CH. However, he does have a more formal name. In the Special Features DVD, Lou Pecora, the compositing supervisor for Digital Domain, refers to the Blender as Dickbot the Blender Guy, which is the name that most people use to refer to this mutant that has a rather suggestively placed cannon. The BlenderBot was supposed to be the leader of the appliance bots, but this never made it into the film. Despite this, footage of him being the leader can be seen in the animatic for the appliance bots, and he was illustrated as the leader in the When Robots Attack storybook. This book would alter BlenderBot's design to have the cannon on his arm. Lastly, in his concept art, he was depicted having his cord wrapped around his arm. However, this detail never made it into the film. The next appliance bot on the list would be ToasterBot, who transforms into a Doolit Vario 4 Slice Toaster. Like DickBot, he does have an official name, that being Ejector. And interestingly enough, out of all the appliance bots, he probably has the most interesting history, since he wasn't even created for Revenge of the Fallen, but for Transformers 2007's marketing campaign. He appeared in a Mountain Dew commercial promoting the Transformers 2007 movie. In the commercial, Ejector snuck into the fridge and stole the last 20-ounce Mountain Dew bottle. When the owner returned to find it missing, he told his roommates that the toaster must have taken it in order to aggravate him. As the owner yelled at the toaster, his roommates pulled him away, whereupon a Jector transformed behind their backs and performed a taunting touchdown dance, rubbing himself obscenely against the cool and glistering surface of the dew bottle while the owner shrieked in impotent rage. Now, in the Mountain Dew commercial, when Robots Attack storybook, and on official design sheets, Ejector has four arms, with him being able to pull one off and turn it into a nunchuck. However, his CGI model would be modified for Revenge of the Fallen. He now only has two arms and has physical nunchucks as a weapon, in addition to a missile launcher on his left arm and a single missile on his right. Another interesting detail to mention is that his body glows red. That is because he is a toaster, and as we know, toaster coils turn red hot in order to heat up bread. The glowing red areas on Ejector are his toaster coils, and thus he can heat them up while in robot mode, which is a sick detail that the animators put in. Furthermore, when he transforms, he makes a toaster ding sound. <laughs> Lastly, up to this point in time, Ejector is the only appliance bot that has a toy. His toy was based off of the forearm design and was part of the fourth wave of Revenge of the Fallen Scout class figures. He transformed into the same toaster that appeared in the commercial and movie. However, his plug deviates from the duelist British standard plug, substituting for a style that appears to be modeled after the AS3112 standard. Now, let's move on to the next appliance bot on the list, which would be the Dyson Vacuum Cleaner bot, which transforms into a, you guessed it, a Dyson DC-25 Vacuum Cleaner. He is by far the tallest out of the appliance bots, and interestingly enough, his physical appearance is very similar to and possibly based off of dispensors. This is especially apparent if you compare the concept art side by side, and without a shadow of a doubt, dispensor was definitely used as a base. Furthermore, Dyson Vacuum Cleaner Bot's missile launcher has the same CGI model as Dispensor's soda can launcher. However, now the colors are orange and red in addition to the projectiles now resembling RPG rockets instead of soda cans. Interestingly enough, when he ran out of ammo, he was able to shoot regular bullets from the middle of his gun. Another thing I noticed is that he appears to have two head designs. In his up-close shot, we can see that he has a total of four eyes. However, in every other shot besides this, he appears to have eight eyes. Another odd thing that I noticed is that during the scene where he and Ejector destroyed Mojo and Frankie's doghouse, Dyson Vacuum Cleaner Bot is missing two of his arms in addition to his shoulder armor. However, those parts are back in the next scene. The next appliance bot on the list would be Microwave Bot, which transforms into a General Electric Spacemaker 2 microwave oven, model number JEM31SF. 
this guy has the least amount of screen time, with him only appearing when he is created and when he is killed. However, this wasn't always going to be the case. When the AllSparks energy made the microwave come to life, we can also see a cell phone that gets affected by the Energon radiation. However, we never see that phone bot after this scene. That is because microwave bot and phone bot scenes were cut from the film. Originally, there was going to be two phone bots, and there was going to be a scene where they were beating up the microwave bot. The microwave bot had enough and thus killed one of the phone bots by incinerating them. This can be seen in the animatic for the appliance bots, in addition to being seen in the concept art for the microwave bot, with the note saying, ready to nuke cell phone. However, this sadly would never make it to the film. Another interesting fact about the microwave bot is that when he transforms, he makes the classic microwave beep sound. Lastly, though we never get to see it clearly on screen, Microwave Bot has an SMG and a missile launcher as his weapons. The next appliance bot to cover is the Waffle Iron Bot, who transforms into a Cuisinart WMR-CA. Now, this guy's very weird since we never see his robot mode. Judy Witwicky is seen stumbling out of the Witwicky household with a Waffle Iron on her head. However, the Waffle Iron Bot does not transform in the film, and is not seen getting activated by the AllSpark. It also just lies on the ground after she throws it off, which is just strange. In the animatic for the appliance bots, it shows the Waffle Iron Bot joining his posse to attack Sam, and he is later seen attacking Judy in his robot mode. Furthermore, in the When Robots Attack storybook, the Waffle Iron Bot is also assaulting Judy in its robot mode. Why this was changed for the final film is unknown. Lastly, Waffle Iron Bot's assault gave Judy a bald spot. Hi, Michaela. Hi. From a waffle iron. The next appliance bot to talk about is Cappuccino Bot, who transforms into a Nespresso De Longhi Espresso Maker. Not much is known about him besides the fact that he can fart fire. In the concept art, he was also able to spit fire, which is a detail that made it into the When Robots Attack storybook. However, a detail that does not appear in the storybook and in the concept art is his buzzsaw weapon that he had when attacking Sam. The next appliance bot to dive into is the Garbage Disposal Bot, who transforms into a Badger Garbage Disposal. Not much is known about him besides the fact that his original design looked vastly different. His current design has him walk on all fours while his original walked on three. His current design has this awesome Vortex Grinder weapon in addition to this massive gun on his belly. He also has this crazy mace weapon on his tail. However, his original design would have had the mace be a handheld weapon, and instead of the vortex grinder and gun on his belly, he would have had missile launchers on his shoulders. This design for the garbage disposal bot would be used in the When Robots Attack storybook. Another fun fact about this guy is that every time he walks around, sludge comes out of his mouth. That is because he is a garbage disposal, and that sludge is what's left of the food that went inside him before he came to life, which is just another awesome detail that the animators put in. Lastly, Steve Yamamoto, the pre-visualization supervisor for Transformers Revenge of the Fallen, would comment that they faked it with this character since his transformation was never shown. The second to last appliance bot to take a look at would be the stand mixer bot, who transforms into a Cuisinart 7 quart stand mixer, model number SM-70. Like some of the previous appliance bots, not much is known about him. However, something I notice is that it seems like the animators gave him the wrong gun in one scene. As we know, the stand mixer bot has a chain gun and a whisk weapon. If we compare it to his VFX model, we can see that he has no other weapons. However, during the scene where the appliance bots raid Sam's room, stand mixer bot's whisk weapon is now replaced by Dyson Vacuum Cleaner bot's missile launcher, which is overkill since his chain gun is also capable of firing missiles. However, when the next scene rolls around, this issue is fixed, since we can now see him back with his whisk weapon. Why this happened has yet to be explained, but it's definitely wacky. Lastly, in the When Robots Attack storybook, Stan Mixer Bot's alternate mode was depicted as a completely different appliance. The last appliance bot to cover is the Cisco Aeronet Bot, which transforms into a Cisco Linksys WRT610N wireless router. The Cisco Aeronet Bot is the smallest of the group, However, what he lacks in size, he makes up in firepower. Since he has these dual missile launchers on his back, he is also the only appliance bot that has one eye. The Cisco logo on the router was greatly enlarged to increase legibility on screen. This was done because the logo on the Aeronet is actually pretty small in real life. 
Lastly, there is one movie mistake with the Cisco Aeronet bot. As we know, he transformed and joined the other appliance bots to attack Sam, and would ultimately be killed off by Bumblebee. However, when we see Sam picking up the shard in the kitchen, you can see the Cisco Aeronet hanging where it was originally. Interestingly enough, it is now plugged in while before it wasn't. And with that said, that concludes all of the appliance bots that appeared in the films. From here, I want to address if Bumblebee was able to kill all of the appliance bots. Since we only see a handful of confirmed kills on screen, those being Cappuccino Bot, Ejector, Dyson Vacuum Cleaner Bot, Microwave Bot, and Garbage Disposal Bot. However, this leaves five unaccounted for, those appliance bots being Dick Bot, Stand Mixer Bot, Cisco Aeronet Bot, Cell Phone Bot, and Waffle Iron Bot. So what happened to those guys? Well, the first three we can infer were taken out by Bumblebee. We know this since he fires a total of three shots that land off screen. He fires two shots as soon as he busts out of the garage. And we know he wasn't shooting at the same target since each shot was in a different direction. Furthermore, his last off-screen shot lands somewhere behind this suitcase. So with that evidence in hand, I am more than 100% sure that those three shots killed Dickbot, Stand Mixer Bot, and Cisco Aeronet Bot. Now, this leaves us with Foam Bot and Waffle Iron Bot. Since we never see Foam Bot again after the Allspark brings him to life, I think it is safe to say that Microwave Bot killed him off screen by putting him in his chest. Lastly, as for Waffle Iron Bot, he's a weird one. But since we never see him move after Judy smacks him into the flower pot, I think it is safe to say that the impact killed him. And with that said, now you know that all of the appliance bots were killed. However, now I want to switch gears and talk about some of the original designs for the appliance bots. In addition to some of the appliance bots that didn't make it into the film, starting off with the original designs, Dickbot was originally going to be a stand mixer, Cappuccino Bot was going to be a yellow coffee maker, Garbage Disposal Bot was going to be way bigger and looked less intimidating, Ejector would have walked on all fours and had missile pods, and Dyson Vacuum Cleaner Bot would have been blue and looked vastly different. Furthermore, Waffle Iron Bot would have been part of the main group, joining the assault on Sam. As for some characters that never made it into the film, there are five. There would have been this white and red crockpot appliance bot that kind of looks like a samurai. There also would have been this hand mixer bot that had a missile pod weapon. Strangely enough, this guy would make an appearance in the When Robots Attack storybook. The last three appliance bots were all phones, two of which had the exact same unique design while the third one would have resembled Nokia bot and would have been killed by one of the phone bots. Microwave bot would end up incinerating one of the phone bots as the other phone bot was a bystander to his twin's death. And with that said, that concludes all of the other appliance bots that did not make it into the film. Now the second to last thing I want to cover is a handful of AllSpark mutations that are part of the expanded Bayformers universe but are not canon to the films. Those being the AllSpark mutations from the comics. In issue 2 and 3 of Transformers Sector 7, after Jetfire activated the AllSpark, it brought to life a radio, a crane, a gun, and a car. These guys would be the four original AllSpark mutations. All of these mutations would be killed by Sector 7. Besides the car mutation who would escape and become Bonnie and Clyde's partner in crime. However, during a shootout with the police, the car killed Bonnie and Clyde to spare them from a miserable life in prison, after which it was destroyed by Margaret Simmons wielding an experimental Sector 7 weapon. Now, the last set of AllSpark mutations that I want to talk about are from the books. In the Look and Find Transformers book, several mutations appeared, those being the PDA bot, the orange car bot, the laptop bot, the iPod bot, the flat screen TV bots, the boombox bot, the cell phone bot, and the Y box bot. Lastly, in the Scholastic Transformers Revenge of the Fallen novel, the Allspark Shard was also able to bring to life the knives and forks that were in the kitchen. As for how this is exactly possible is anyone's guess. Now, the last and final thing that I want to cover is the Allspark mutations that were cut from the Bumblebee movie, which is the first film in the newly rebooted Transformers cinematic universe. And these guys weren't even called Allspark mutations, but instead Energon mutations. This is because the Allspark did not bring these machines to life, but instead Bumblebee's Energon. In the Bumblebee movie, there's a scene where Bumblebee plugs himself into a wall socket, causing an Energon-infused power surge that travels down nearby power lines. Originally, this Energon-infused power surge would have brought many of Charlie Watson's appliances to life. 
such as a washing machine, a ceiling fan, a dishwasher, a fridge, a TV, and an alarm clock. They would have been deactivated by Charlie and her friend Mimo. Now, despite these Energon mutations being cut, they would appear in the junior novel and junior reader adaptations of the Bumblebee movie. This is because this scene was cut very late into production. And just like that, that is everything you need to know about the AllSpark mutations. If you made it this far into the video, you must really like Transformers. And I wouldn't be too far off to say that you're likely interested in robotics and AI. If so, you might find today's sponsor, Brilliant, of interest to you. Brilliant is a brilliant interactive learning platform that's goal is to teach you math, science, and computer science in a completely fun way. Brilliant has thousands of lessons on their site that you can learn, ranging from very basic lessons in everyday math to very advanced lessons in quantum computing. Just learning a little of something every day can have a huge impact. A personal example of mine is that I recently started my freshman year of college, and Brilliance Refresher courses in math are really helping me succeed in my college algebra class. So why not learn something new by giving Brilliant a shot? To get started for free, visit brilliant.org slash transtheories, or click the link in the description below, and the first 200 of you will get 20% off Brilliant's annual premium subscription. And with that said, I want to say thank you to Brilliant for sponsoring this video. I hope you guys enjoyed this video, and if you have not already, check out the Fixing Transformers playlist for some more awesome theories. But before I go, I want to say thank you to all my Patreons and channel members for for supporting the channel. Without you guys, Trans Theories would not be where it is today, so a big fat thank you to all of you. And as always, if you enjoyed the video, please consider giving a like rating because it does help the channel a lot. With that said, hit that outro.